This is NTD Evening News. Live from our NTD Global Headquarters in New York City, here is Tiffany Meyer. Good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. The very first criminal trial of a former president is underway in New York City with a lengthy process of jury selection beginning today. Prosecutors and defense attorneys are expected to grill hundreds of Manhattan residents in an effort to find 12 jurors plus six alternates who will decide the fate of former President Trump. Today, more than half of the 96 jurors brought in by Judge Juan Marchand were quickly dismissed because they said they could not be fair and impartial. The day wrapped up with no jurors being seated. The process will resume tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. with the judge urging everyone to show up on time. Trump is accused of falsifying business records to conceal payments to adult film actress Stormy Daniels during the 2016 presidential campaign. This is the first of Trump's four indictments to go to trial. Our legal correspondent Arlene Richards is at the courthouse with the latest. Monday is the first day of jury selection in the historic trial of former President Donald Trump. But before the jurors entered the courtroom, Judge Juan Mershon addressed a few outstanding matters. The issues range from jury questions to sanctions. Trump was in the courtroom throughout the day. He made a brief speech as he arrived. This is an assault on America. Nothing like this has ever happened before. It's never been anything like it. Every legal scholar said this case is nonsense. It should never have been brought. It doesn't deserve anything like this. There is no case, and they've said it. People that don't necessarily follow or like Donald Trump said this is an outrage that this case was brought. This is political persecution. Prosecutors asked for permission to introduce testimony relating to a series of stories the National Enquirer ran attacking Trump's 2016 opponents. According to prosecutors, the stories came after an August 2015 meeting at Trump Tower. Judge Juan Mershon says he will allow the stories into evidence because it's necessary to complete the narrative of what took place. He will also allow testimony from Karen McDougal. McDougal is a model and actress who says she had a months-long affair with Trump in 2006 and was paid $150,000 to keep quiet. The judge denied the prosecution's request to show the 2005 Access Hollywood video in which Trump can be heard making a derogatory comment about women. He also won't allow the prosecution to show Trump's E. Jean Carroll deposition. On the defense side, Judge Mershon denied their motion, asking him to recuse himself. He says he won't consider it again until the appellate court rules. He will hold a hearing on April 24th on the prosecution's motion to sanction Trump for his social media posts. Trump's lawyers have until Friday to file their written response. As for the jury, Mershon said he has changed his mind on how attorneys will question individual jurors. If they want to question a juror, all other jurors will be removed from the courtroom so the individual juror doesn't feel intimidated. Jury selection got underway at about 2 p.m. this afternoon. Judge Juan Mershon explained the case to the jurors, and he strongly advised them that they alone would be the ones to decide the facts in this case, and that it's the prosecution's responsibility to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. Trump doesn't have to prove anything. Arlene Richards reporting from the criminal courthouse in Manhattan. The White House urging de-escalation as Israel weighs its response to Iran's weakened attack. That says President Biden, in his first remarks after the strikes, insists that the U.S. remains committed to Israel's security. NTD's White House correspondent Iris Tao brings us the latest. And President Biden reassuring U.S. commitment to Israel's security while vowing to stop the war from getting even wider. The United States is committed to Israel's security. We're committed to a ceasefire that will bring the hostages home and preventing conflict from spreading beyond what it already has. Those remarks came as Biden's meeting with the Prime Minister of Iraq on Monday. Thus, as tensions are growing in the Middle East after Iran on Saturday launched over 300 drones toward Israel, though most of which intercepted by Israel and its allies, including the U.S. The White House on Monday denied reports that Iran gave the U.S. an early warning or meant for the attack to fail. Given the scale of this attack, Iran's intent was clearly to cause significant destruction 
and casualties. This whole narrative out there that Iran passed us a message with what they were going to do is ridiculous. While President Biden is touting how the U.S. and partners, quote, defeated Iran's attack, the administration said it would not participate if Israel decides to strike back, that to prevent a war between the U.S. and Iran. Why is the U.S. not going to participate in a counteroffensive? We're not looking for a war with Iran. We're not looking to broaden and deepen this conflict in the region. The IDF said on Monday that Iran's attack over the weekend will be, quote, met with a response. While the White House says it's not involved in Israel's decision-making process, it also declines to say if President Biden, during a Sunday call, told Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to exercise restraint while responding. Reporting by Iris Tao, NTD News. The number of Iranian drones and missiles that were shot down before reaching Israel may be a telling sign of Iran's military capabilities. NTD's Jack Bradley brings us more from the U.S. State Department. Iran's unprecedented attack against Israel included nearly 300 missiles and drones, nearly all of which were shot down by the U.S., Israel and their allies. But what's the extent of Iran's military capabilities? Here's State Department spokesman Matthew Miller. What does it say about Iran's military capabilities and uh, how, do the, uh, how does this attack affect uh, any diplomatic strategies between the U.S., Israel and their allies? Well, what it says about their military capabilities is that they shot over 300 drones and missiles and the vast majority of them did not make it through. We do not believe that a wider regional war is in anyone's interest. It's not in Iran's interest, not in Israel's interest, not in the interest of the broader, broader region. So that's why we have tried to, um, uh, to prevent one. Miller also said the unprecedented Iranian attack violated the sovereignty of other countries. The United States, along with Britain, France and Jordan, helped Israel intercept most of the missiles over the weekend. Jordan shot down dozens of Iran's drones over its airspace that were heading to Israel. Miller said the Biden administration put more than 500 sanctions on Iran and Iranian entities. He said these sanctions drive up costs for Iran's weapons program. The Biden administration wants to de-escalate the conflict as tensions have heightened since the October 7th Hamas terrorist attacks against Israel. Hamas, a proxy of Iran, continues to hold captive dozens of Israeli hostages. The terrorist group rejected the latest proposal by Israel and its allies for a deal that would lead to a ceasefire and the freeing of hostages. The U.S. continues to support Israel and this past weekend was a clear example of their aid to help shoot down these missiles and drones. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Jack Bradley, NTD News. Congress is expected to vote on over a dozen bills targeting Iran and address the impeachment of DHS Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, as well as finalize reauthorization of FISA powers. Our Washington correspondent, Luis Martinez, has more details on this week's packed legislative agenda. It's a decisive week for Speaker of the House Mike Johnson, who has to manage a divided conference and also mounting pressure on Congress to take action on foreign military supplemental aid to beleaguered allies. Speaker Mike Johnson posted on X calling for the U.S. government to show full support to Israel and that the Biden administration's undermining of Israel and appeasement of Iran have contributed to these terrible developments. While Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene posted on X, quote, Why do I feel this week is going to be another week of America last? Unquote. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene has already submitted a motion to oust Speaker Johnson and warned the Speaker that she would activate the motion depending on how the Speaker deals with Ukraine aid. On the other hand, Democratic Senator Chris Coons has asked Speaker Mike Johnson to put the $95 billion Senate-approved supplemental aid package on the House floor for a vote. I think would be most appropriate for the Congress to do in response is for Speaker Johnson to put on the floor tomorrow the supplemental that was passed by the Senate that Senate-approved supplemental aid package contains around $60 billion for Ukraine and approximately $30 billion for Israel and Taiwan. A discharge petition to move past Speaker Mike Johnson and move ahead with the Senate-approved supplemental aid package bill already has 190 signatures. Beyond the debate on aid, congressional Republicans have been very critical of Democrats who want to condition aid to Israel. Well, I'm not going to tell Israel what to do because I'm not the one that was attacked by 300 rockets and, and uh, missiles and drones. The House of Representatives is expected to vote on over a dozen bills to further sanction Iran. The House is also expected to vote on a motion to reconsider the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act that passed the House floor last week before sending it to the Senate. 
The House Republicans are also expected to send articles of impeachment against Secretary of Homeland Security Alejandro Mayorkas to the Senate floor this week. Reporting from Washington, D.C., Luis Eduardo Martinez, NTD News. The FBI is investigating the collapse of the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore last month. The bridge collapsed after a support tower was struck by the container ship Dali, causing the bridge to fall into the Patapsco River on March 26th. A spokesperson for the FBI's Baltimore field office at the agency boarded the cargo ship Dali today and is conducting court-authorized searches. The FBI is reportedly looking into whether or not the crew left the port while aware of major issues with the vessel, according to the Washington Post. Record numbers of Chinese nationals continue to enter the U.S. illegally. New data shows that more have entered so far this fiscal year than during all of fiscal year 2023. The new numbers show that the Border Patrol encountered over 2,000 Chinese citizens in March. This brings the total since October to over 24,000. That's already more than the number for the entire fiscal year 2023 in comparison. In 2021, the Border Patrol encountered fewer than 400 Chinese citizens. Republicans from the House Homeland Security Committee commented on X saying most of these individuals are simply processed and released into the U.S. Adversarial nations are exploiting Secretary Mayorkas's open borders. Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene says Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer must hold the impeachment trial in the Senate of Secretary Mayorkas. Fox News reports that the House of Representatives is planning to transfer the articles of impeachment to the Senate on Tuesday afternoon. They were supposed to do that last week, but delayed the transfer in order to have more time and build a stronger case. The Department of Homeland Security is calling the move an evidence-free impeachment, saying there have been no high crimes or misdemeanors. They also call the process cynical and hypocritical. Some House Republicans said they're concerned Schumer will move quickly to dismiss the impeachment case. The Senate Majority Leader criticized the attempt to impeach Mayorkas, but said he'd pick up the case. In New Mexico, a weapons supervisor for the movie Rust was sentenced earlier today. This in connection with the fatal shooting of a cinematographer by actor Alec Baldwin in 2021. I find that what you did constitutes a zero, serious violent offense. It was committed in a physically violent manner, a fatal gunshot done with your recklessness in the face of knowledge that your acts were reasonably likely to result in serious harm. You were the armorer, the one that stood between a safe weapon and a weapon that could kill someone. You alone turned a safe weapon into a lethal weapon. But for you, Ms. Hutchins would be alive a husband would have his partner, and a little boy would have his mother. 27-year-old Hannah Gutierrez-Reed was sentenced to 18 months in prison. That is the maximum penalty the prosecutors sought. In March, a jury convicted the Rust movie Armorer on a charge of involuntary manslaughter. Gutierrez-Reed has been held for more than a month at a county jail following the conviction. Prosecutors blamed her for unwittingly bringing live ammunition onto the set of rust where it was expressly prohibited and for failing to follow basic gun safety protocols. During the sentencing, the judge pointed out Gutierrez-Reed's lack of remorse. Gutierrez-Reed's attorney, on the other hand, claimed that it was Baldwin who was ultimately responsible for the fatal shooting. Baldwin's trial is scheduled for July before the same judge. Joining me now to dive into former President Trump's New York hush money trial is Zach Smith. He's a former federal prosecutor and now senior legal fellow at the Heritage Foundation. Zach Smith, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Great to be back with you. Now, Trump's historic hush money trial begins today with jury selection. Now, this is the first time a former president is being tried criminally. Trump is also the presumptive GOP nominee for president. What precedent do you see this trial setting? Well, I think it sets a very troubling precedent in a lot of ways, especially when we view it in conjunction with the prosecution that's moving forward in Fulton County, Georgia right now. When we look at it in terms of the uh, Jack Smith cases, the federal prosecutions that are being brought against Donald Trump, I think it sets a very troubling precedent that in the future, uh, that future administrations, future presidents 
could try to go after their political opponents. And keep in mind, not only is Donald Trump a former president, but he is also one of the leading presidential candidates currently, uh, which makes this entire situation even more unprecedented than it already is. And in terms of this case, Trump is being charged with falsifying business records, which is a Class E felony, which is the least serious type of felony in New York. Now, help us understand the specifics of this case. Would this normally be prosecuted in this manner? Well, I doubt it would normally be prosecuted, particularly when you look at the prosecution policies of Alvin Bragg. Alvin Bragg is a prosecutor who came into office pledging not to prosecute entire categories of crimes. And we've seen the consequences of that in New York City. And yet in this case with Donald Trump, he's using a very novel legal theory to essentially try to bootstrap what, as you mentioned, would ordinarily be misdemeanor cases and elevate those into felony cases, even though they are low-level felonies. Because they go from a misdemeanor to a felony, the consequences can potentially be much more serious if Donald Trump is found guilty. Expanding on that, Trump is being charged with a felony based on the accusation that he falsified business records with the intent to conceal information or another crime in regards to his 2016 campaign. How do you prove intent in court? Well, there's a lot of ways you can prove intent. You can do it through direct evidence. You can do it through testimony, circumstantial evidence uh, from other individuals. But look, essentially, as I understand it, the other crime that Donald Trump is alleged to have covered up is essentially a campaign finance violation, a federal campaign finance violation. And what's interesting about this is that the federal U.S. that the Federal Department of Justice, the U.S. Justice Department, decided not to pursue those charges against Donald Trump, and that yet now you have Alvin Bragg bringing a New York state prosecution essentially predicated on those same charges. It's a novel legal theory. It's an unprecedented situation, and as we were discussing earlier, I think it sets a very troubling and a very dangerous precedent for this case to be brought. Now, Trump's team is arguing there's no way he will get a fair trial in New York City. Now, the judge in this case today called the jury questions by far the most exhaustive questionnaire the court has ever used. How likely are we to see a truly fair and impartial jury? Well, I think certainly everyone would hope that a jury would be fair and impartial. But look, I don't think it would come as any surprise that the citizens of New York City, the citizens of Washington, D.C., uh, where uh, the federal case is pending against Donald Trump, one of the federal cases is pending, uh, certainly are overwhelmingly democratic, uh, overwhelmingly have expressed a displeasure with Donald Trump and some of his previous policies. And so I would hope that the questioning would be very extensive, very exhaustive and that the judge and the advocates in this case would really drill down to make sure that these jurors truly can be fair and impartial. Now, stepping back a bit, many analysts say this is maybe the weakest case against Trump, especially criminally. What's your view on the likelihood of him getting convicted here? Well, look, I certainly think the, the legal theory behind this case is very weak. And if Donald Trump is convicted, I think he would have ample grounds to appeal that conviction. Uh, but just realistically looking, what we were talking about just a minute ago, uh, this jury pool certainly is not likely to be favorable to Donald Trump. Uh, it's certainly to be a by and large hostile jury pool that will be hearing this case against Donald Trump. And so there is a very real possibility that he could be convicted, even though legally speaking, uh, these charges are of a very questionable nature. Uh, but we'll just have to wait and see how all of this plays out. Uh, but again, this is certainly an unprecedented situation and a very troubling one at that. Zach Smith, thank you so much for your time. Of course, thank you for having me on. A new poll is out on the race for the White House. It shows that President Biden and former President Trump remain locked in a close race. At the same time, major media organizations are urging the two to debate. Entity's Dave Martin has more. According to the nationwide poll from the New York Times and Siena College, 46% of registered voters say they're supporting Trump, with 45% saying they support Biden. That's a tighter race compared with the last New York Times-Siena poll in late February. 
In that survey, Trump led Biden by five points. And yet, the two candidates don't have any debates scheduled. On Sunday, about a dozen news organizations posted an open letter urging them to square off on stage. The letter says general election debates have played a vital role in every presidential election in the last 50 years, going back to 1976. The letter also says that tens of millions have tuned in to watch the competition for the votes of American citizens. Biden hasn't publicly committed to debating Trump, although he hasn't ruled it out. Trump has said he would debate Biden anytime, anywhere. The Associated Press, CBS News, CNN, Fox, ABC, NBC, PBS, NPR, and C-SPAN are among the media outlets that released the statement. As for third-party contender Robert F. Kennedy Jr., he says he won't run on the Libertarian Party ticket. He told ABC News he's met with Libertarian Party leaders many times and kept the door open but now says his campaign doesn't need the party. His campaign recently fired one of his New York staffers. Last week, Rita Palma posted a video saying backing Kennedy would help Trump beat Biden in November. According to a campaign spokesperson, Palma falsely identified herself as the New York State Director of Kennedy's campaign. The spokesperson said Palma is a ballot access consultant and that she's not involved in electoral strategy nationally or in New York. This is Dave Martin for NTD News. A cybersecurity company has shut down over 250 websites selling counterfeit drugs for weight loss and diabetes. NTD's Christina Corona has more. Brand Shield CEO Yoav Karen told Reuters that of the 279 online pharmacy websites shut down last year for selling drugs targeting metabolic conditions, over 90% were associated with GLP-1 medications. Novo Nordisk's Ozempic and Wegovi and Eli Lilly's Monjaro and Zepbound belong to the class of GLP-1 drugs. Originally designed for type 2 diabetes treatment, they also curb appetite and slow stomach emptying. These medications have demonstrated the ability to help patients shed up to 20% of their weight on average. This has led to a surge in demand and the growth of a counterfeit market worldwide. Cases of harmful side effects associated with counterfeit Ozempic and other GLP-1 drugs have been documented in nine countries such as Belgium, the United Kingdom, Switzerland, and the United States. Brandshield partnered with the Pharmaceutical Security Institute, or PSI, to take down the websites. PSI members, including Lilly and Novo, chose the targeted drugs. Brandshield collected evidence of counterfeit products and submitted it to hosting providers to remove the sites. Upon request, Brandshield shared this data with law enforcement. The company removed over 6,900 illegal drug listings from various social media platforms and marketplaces, including 992 marketplaces in India, 544 in Indonesia, 364 in China, and 114 in Brazil. Karen stated the company lacked data on the number of social media listings and marketplaces selling fake versions of GLP-1s. Christina Corona, NTD News. A prison guard is accused of getting prohibited cell phones for inmates. The security supervisor in South Carolina allegedly accepted over $200,000 in bribes. Christine Mary Livingston was indicted on 15 charges, including supplying over 170 contraband cell phones. She has worked at the Broad River Correctional Institution for 16 years. She's accused of working with inmate Gerald Reeves to transfer bribes using Cash App. He's serving a 15-year sentence for fatally shooting a man in a convenience store. The two face up to 20 years in prison, a $250,000 fine, and an order to pay back the bribes if convicted. Contraband cell phones in South Carolina prisons are a longtime problem. In 2018, they helped spur a riot in one of the state's prisons. Since 2015, prison officials have discovered over 35,000 cell phones, more than double the number of inmates in the system. Joining me now to analyze the Biden administration's response to Iran's attack is Tommy Waller. He's the president and CEO of the Center for Security Policy. Tommy Waller, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Tiffany. 
Now, Iran launched a slew of missiles and drones on Israel over the weekend. Almost all were intercepted. Now, Iran has said that the attacks has concluded, but that if Israel retaliates, Iran will then attack again and much stronger. Now, President Biden has reportedly told Israeli's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, quote, you got a win, take the win. How do you see Israel responding? How likely is this to escalate? Yeah, well, if President Biden is telling uh, Netanyahu that you've got to win, uh, that's absolutely wrong. Um, what what Israel fortunately had, they were blessed with having the world's most comprehensive ballistic missile system and a whole lot of people praying for that country. And that resulted in, as you mentioned, 99 percent of those munitions being down. But look, the numbers were staggering, Tiffany. We're talking 350 roughly munitions, right? Thankfully, about half of them either failed over Iranian territory or at launch, uh, about 25% were actually intercepted by the air forces of, of, of or the, the assets of CENTCOM. And thankfully, Israel has some allies in the region, right? Even Saudi Arabia, although they were very vague about it, they actually participated in making sure some of that didn't come through their airspace to hit Israel. And so a win for Israel is being the strong horse in the region and deterring further aggression from Iran. I mean, what you're talking about is a regime. The Ayatollahs have lit brush fires all over that region for decades. And if they think they can get away with it, they'll continue to do it. And so Biden's absolutely incorrect in articulating this as a win. This is what it's supposed to look like when somebody attacks your nation with ballistic missiles and you have your plan together. And honestly, Tiffany, we have a lot to learn. Our ballistic missile defense is not nearly as good as Israel's. President Biden is calling for a united diplomatic response to the uh, Iran attack, but he also reportedly told Israeli's prime minister that the U.S. won't participate in is any Israeli offensive operations against Iran. The State Department as well is calling on Israel to exercise, quote, strength and wisdom in its next steps. Now, what is your assessment of the Biden administration's response so far? One word, Tiffany, Biden administration's response is appeasement as it has been in nearly every theater of this world when it comes to conflict, including our own southern border. These conflicts are all connected. These adversaries are paying very close attention because they are communicating with each other, learning from each other, and they all hate the West. And when I say the West, I mean the United States, Israel, and those European countries that value the freedom that we enjoy. And so when Biden says, you know, that administration says, oh, wisdom, no, what they mean is appeasement. And unfortunately, it seems at every turn that they are really hamstringing Israel. Look, on some of the sources that we have in, in our network say that there was already a retaliatory response planned by Israel that this administration shut down. The way that Israel can win is by being the strong horse. And that means making sure that Iran knows it cannot get away with an attack like this without severe punishment. And look, Tiffany, the other thing is this. There are millions of Iranian people who have suffered for decades underneath the tyrannical Islamic regime who would be inspired if they saw that regime held accountable for the things it does not only to Israel and the rest of the world, but even to its own people. And I think that's a point that this administration doesn't even want to consider. And Tommy, how much of what we're seeing play out now and even back to October 7th plays into the perceived weakness on the international stage of U.S. deterrence? Look, I think October 7th in Israel was should have been a major wake-up call for the United States. It was a major wake-up call for Israel, right? Israel had really over-reliance on a lot of its technical prowess. We did thankfully just see that ballistic missile defense perform as it should. But there was an over-reliance on that and under-reliance on intelligence, particularly human intelligence, right? And then there was also the notion that, you know, this could never happen here. And all of that was shattered on October 7th. And in fact, Tiffany, we recently, just this week, we published a report, a case study about October 7th at our Center for Security Policy. We just published it this week. It allows the, the reader and your viewers, if they're able to go to centerforsecuritypolicy.org, the opportunity to read just how connected all of those adversaries have been and still are. What were the Russians and the Chinese doing and the North Koreans, for example, and just how complacent Israel was at that time and how complacent we are here in the United States in the face of these global threats. 
And given all of these concerns, what are the necessary steps to address these concerns and counter it? Tiffany, the very first thing is to wake up, right? We are complacent. We are so much more complacent than Israel was on October 6th. The Israeli people woke up on October 7th, and thankfully, I mean, what you saw were hundreds of thousands of volunteers mobilized and flocked to that country and in that country to put the uniform on and fight for their country. They woke up. We in America need to wake up to just how close this is to us. It's all connected. Tiffany, it's, it's in our report, the connected nature between all these adversaries and even our open southern border. It's time for Americans to wake up. Tommy Waller, thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. Thank you, Tiffany, for having me on. To hear more from Tommy Waller about China's role in the Middle East conflict, tune into China in Focus tonight at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. We'll analyze what China may learn from Iran's attack for its plans in Taiwan, what it means that the U.S. is inviting Beijing to act as a mediator, and how Chinese tech is not only used by America's adversaries, but also by law enforcement here at home. Killed for selling state secrets to America, that's what a Chinese state media campaign seems to suggest. The video clip boasts China's success in combating foreign espionage. It zooms in on a spy called Huang Yu. He was executed in 2016 for selling state secrets. The clip made no mention of the foreign country, but it showed footage of CIA headquarters in the clip. China said he handed over secrets, including military communications, to a foreign government. Media's report he was executed a month after his conviction. Zooming out, the CIA director last year said the agency has been working to rebuild its spy network in China. Beijing pledged countermeasures in response. Over a decade ago, China rolled up a lot of CIA operations, killing or arresting a dozen or more sources. Last year, China also updated its anti-espionage law, banning the transfer of any information deemed to relate to national security, a move that unnerved some foreign businesses and investors. Turning to Australia, Sydney police have identified the perpetrator of fatal stabbings near Bondi Beach in Australia. People witnessed scenes of chaos at a shopping center as the attacker killed six people before being shot and killed by police. New South Wales police say 40-year-old Joel Couchy was responsible. Footage published on social media by an eyewitness showed crowds of people running to evacuate the mall as the body of the attacker laid on the ground surrounded by officers. No, I work in the cafe the way the guy was shot, like right in front. I'm feeling really terrified to be honest and tired, I don't know, to be honest what I'm, it's like mixed reaction. I sort of turn around and everyone's screaming and sprinting and they're like, it was like a movie, like a horror movie and the fear in everyone's face is just like terrifying and everyone's just pushing and pushing. New South Wales police said five of the six victims killed were women, while eight people, including a nine-month-old baby, was taken to the hospital with stab wounds. At this stage, they did not believe the attack was terrorism-related. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese said there was no indication yet of the man's motive. In a written statement, the attacker's family said they were devastated by the events and they had no issue with police shooting their son. They called his actions truly horrific, saying they were still trying to comprehend what had happened. The family also said that he battled mental health issues since he was a teenager. A church in a suburb of Sydney, Australia was the site of another stabbing today. It came just two days after the deadly attack at the shopping mall. And just a warning, some viewers may find the following footage disturbing. The church was live streaming at the time. The video shows a man lunging at a bishop before repeatedly stabbing him during a sermon. A number of people were hurt, but there were no life-threatening injuries. The victims are receiving medical treatment. Officers arrested a male. For months, a homeless crisis has overtaken a rural community in southern Oregon. Now the town is attracting national attention as its camping ban goes before the Supreme Court this month. NTD's Andrew Thomas has the latest. Yesterday morning, volunteers assisted an 80-year-old man from his tent into a wheelchair. They helped him move to another park to avoid being fined. I would say um, this 
the situation's only escalating and uh, we're seeing more and more people unhoused and at the same time we're seeing more and more friction and frustration from community members on both sides um, because we've been paralyzed for the last few years waiting for um, the court case to be over. I Residents are fed up with drug use and discarded needles next to playgrounds and sports fields in this rural Oregon town. On Saturday, they rallied outside City Hall with signs reading, Parks are for kids. Passing drivers honked in support. For years, I'd go to the park and walk in the park, and I'd see kids playing and the families and all the get-togethers we had. And, uh, and that was taken away from us when the campers start using the parks. Cities nationwide have been struggling to address homelessness. Debate over whether they can fine or jail people for camping in public has caused controversy. Families are afraid to go to the parks. And it's not just the campers or the homeless, it's the drug use and the vandalism and the excessive littering. Needles on the ground, broken meth pipes on the ground. So no one wants to take the kids anymore. Grants past Mayor Sarah Bristol wants safe parks, but says the ban doesn't address homelessness. But we, we still have like 200 people who have to go somewhere, and so I just don't really see how the, that resolves um, the issue. Some advocates fear that anti-camping enforcement will push people out of town and perpetuate the issue. Um, if these civil or criminal penalties can be enforced, it will likely uh, go back to a status quo of cycles of incarceration, which uh, also facilitates cycles of homelessness. The high court will hear the case on April 22nd. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. And now for your sports news, we're joined by NTD's Dave Martin. Dave, Scotty Scheffler won the Masters yesterday in a dominant fashion. Now, heading into this event last week, was he being mentioned as a favorite? I mean, yes, despite all the hoopla over a Tiger Woods return, Scheffler was probably the number, the number one favorite. I mean, he's ranked number one in the world right now. This was his second major win after winning the same event uh, two years ago. This is also his eighth PGA victory in just over a two-year period and third this spring, so he's really hot. Now heading into the final round Sunday, he had just a one-stroke lead, but he pulled away on the back nine. He will claim the three and a half million dollar winner's prize. That's the most they've ever gave out. Now he may not have the same name recognition, of course, as a Tiger was, but if he keeps, he, yeah, if he keeps playing like this, he certainly will get there. Well, speaking of Tiger Woods, a lot was made of him making the Masters cut. Where did he end up? Well, he had a tough weekend, finished in last place. That's 60th out of 60 golfers of the, of the players who made the weekend cut anyway. Now, he had his worst round ever at the Masters on Saturday, 10 over par. That included back-to-back -back double bogeys as well as four straight single bogeys in the back nine. He followed that up with a better round four on Sunday, but unfortunately, he also had a triple bogey on the fifth there. It still ended up as his worst 72-hole score as a professional. Now, afterwards, he actually called it a good week. I can sort of understand. I mean, this is the first time he was able to finish a major in like two years. I mean, he's had so many setbacks with injury. I mean, this was his, just his seventh event period in the last three years, so it's not surprising he's really rusty. Of course, it's very... It's unusual to see one of the greats struggle like this. We've never quite seen him do that. But looking forward, it looks like he's planning to play once, uh, once a month and over the next few months. So we'll have to see how that goes. Well, shifting gears to sports memorabilia news, the most famous white Ford Bronco ever, the one in the O.J. Simpson chase, is reportedly going to be up for sale soon. How much are they hoping for? One and a half million dollars. That's according to one of its three owners, uh, Michael Gilbert, who's a former agent for O.J. Simpson. Now, the white Bronco wasn't actually O.J.'s. It was it belonged to his friend, uh, former teammate Al Callings. Now, Callings was actually teammates with O.J. in high school, college, and even the pros. Now, it's a 1993 Bronco. It's pretty much been out of sight since the famous incident. I mean, at one point, it was parked in a condominium garage for 17 years. So I'm guessing you'll need a little bit of work if you actually want to drive it. I mean, reportedly only has 32,000 miles on it. And it was actually on an episode of Pawn Shop at one point a few years ago. But it is the most famous Ford Bronco ever. I mean, 100 million people watched that event some 30 years ago. I'm not sure who buys these kinds of things, but it's a very memorable piece of American history. Well, tonight in women's basketball, the WNBA draft is happening. Where is NCAA Player of the Year Caitlin Clark projected to be picked? Yeah, she is the projected first pick in the draft. And in all honesty, I can't remember this much publicity over a WNBA draft or WNBA event ever. Uh, the Indiana Fever, they have the first pick. They've already confirmed a spike in season ticket sales. I mean, they averaged just over 4,000 fans a game last year while playing in an 18,000-seat arena. Meanwhile, according to 
ticket reseller Vivid Seats. Her first road game, which is at the Connecticut Sun, has seen a 90% price increase. SeatGeek is also reporting that the uh, Indiana Fever's home games are going for an average uh, price of $182. That's a 136% increase over last year. I mean, this is like the LeBron James effect, uh, but we've never seen this kind of excitement in women's basketball before. Well, Dave, as always, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me, Tiff.